Okay, so today I want to talk a little bit more about this GIT picture. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about GIT on torque rays, which, uh, so the nice thing about this is that, well, you know, AN is a torque ray and so is PN, so um, if you want to take a quotient by a torus, on any variety, then it's pretty likely that you can view that as uh, a quotient of a torque variety, and then you just, you know, look at some closed subscheme. So even though this seems very specific, it's pretty general. And in birational geometry, when we're using this GIT machinery, we really, we really only need it for torus quotients for the abelian case. Um, now, of course. You know, this is a, a much broader theory. It applies to quotients by all uh, reductive groups, but uh, today I'm going to think about the case where the target variety, some x, and then, of course, you know, we have t, let's just call it t big, inside x, and this is open and dense. And then we have our T that's acting on X sitting inside here, which is just, you know, some subtorus. And so we want to understand is, you know, what's going on in this picture. And the idea with GIT is that we're going to take, you know, we're going to formulate a way of taking the quotient of X by T. If I take the quotient of X by the big torus, then I just get a point, right? Because, you know, I'm quotienting like dimension N thing by dimension N thing. But this has smaller dimensions, so I get some interesting variety out. Okay, and so I want to think about like how our GIT machinery works in this case. Okay, so so what do we have to do? The idea is we extend the action of well, instead of just doing it for t, we'll just do it for the big torus. So T big to L, an ample line bundle on X. Okay, so to understand this, let's just start with the divisor theory of torque rays. And I'll illustrate this just by means of the simple example of, uh, Maybe I'll do the blow of P2 at one point so that it's uh, you know it's a little more interesting than just P2. So as an example, uh, if I take x equals the blow up of P2, uh, P2 at a single point, then this torque ray comes from a fan. It's a two-dimensional torque ray, and so I have a fan in N tensor R where this n is isomorphic to v2. And the picture is the following. I have one quadrant, and then to get p2, I have the vector in the opposite direction to the sum of these two. And then to make the blow up, uh, I just select, you know, I'm gonna blow up one of this torus and variant points, and there's three choices. And of course, <coughs> this variety is so symmetric that it doesn't matter which one I pick that they're all isomorphic via just changing the basis of the lattice. Uh, so arbitrarily, I'm going to pick this one. The vectors are E2, E1, uh, minus E1, and minus E1, minus E2. OK. And a divisor or, you know, in this case, divisors and line bundles are the same thing. Um, so divisor is just, I assign to every ray of this torque, of this fan, an integer, and, you know, that gives me uh, the, the, the Vey divisor just corresponding to that weighted sum of the torus invariant divisors. So this guy, you know, so, so these guys correspond to the strict transforms of the coordinate lines. Um, and then we blew up the intersection of these two coordinate lines. So this, this is, you know, one of the lines through the blown up point, another line through the blown up point, 
the exceptional divisor, and then your line at infinity if you like. We'll just label these as L, L minus E, L minus E, and E. So if I want an ample divisor on this, it turns out that if you take the, uh, the quadrus through the point, so if I take the class 2L minus E, that's an ample divisor. So, and you'll notice, okay, if I want to write 2L minus E, then, well, I mean, in particular, these two guys are, are equivalent to each other. So I can always, you know, if I have a number here, I can switch it with a number here. And this guy is equivalent to the sum of these two, or these two, you know, however you prefer. So if I have like a one here, I can turn it into a one and a one. So it seems like I have some freedom. And that just corresponds to the fact that um, these torus invariant divisors, they, uh, um, you know, they are linearly equivalent exactly when they're made linearly equivalent by, or their difference is the vanishing of some torus character. And so that gives us kind of a two-dimensional space to play around in. And so there's exactly two degrees of freedom in how I turn a divisor class into a torus invariant divisor. Okay, so if I want, let's say I take a one here, a one here, and a one here. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, so now, if I want to think about what this divisor is in terms of its global sections, what we do is we say, okay, well, the global sections are going to be rational functions who have poles better and no worse than a pole here, a pole here, a pole here, and nothing here. So it's not allowed to have any poles here. It could have zeros or relics, but those are how bad the poles can be. And you know, if we and you know, it, you can break up the, uh, you know, just via, you know, the, the fact that you have the, <coughs> yeah, the the <coughs> the global sections of this divisor, they're going to give you a vector space that's a representation of this torus. So you can break it apart into torus and varying pieces, you know, just by because it's a reductive group. So uh, what that tells us is that. What we're looking for are characters, so elements of the lattice M, which satisfy some conditions about where their poles are. So global sections, so these are elements of M with conditions on poles and zeros. Well, those conditions are exactly given by these numbers here. What is the idea? Well, let's draw the lattice M. So we have our origin here, and then we have the dual of E2, of E1. So the idea is that if I dot with my, if, if I take the product in the negative E1 direction, then, you know, that's looking at the order of vanishing along that divisor minus E1. So you can think of the, the elements in this N as valuation. So the, the idea is this valuation here is vanishing along this divisor. And we're saying that the order of the pole is not worse than one. So the order of vanishing is greater than negative one. Which is saying, okay, well, I have to be to the left of this hyper, this line here. So this is uh, saying that the vanishing along of my character along E1 is greater than or equal to negative 1. Which is saying, well, I'm on this side of this line. And then, you know, I just can keep repeating that for the different, uh, the different guys I have here. So this one for E2 saying, okay, my, when I pair my, my character with E2, I should get something greater than negative one. So that says, okay, then I'm above this line here. Okay, and so it's like, you know, the fact that you have this minus sign here, that's why one of the, 
you know, that's why there's the other convention where uh, an ample divisor might have negative coefficients, but it's, you know, it's like you have a kind of an unpleasant negative somewhere. So, you know, you either have it over here or over here, and I prefer to have it over here. Okay, so let's see. So we've done this one and that one. Let's do L minus E. So this is saying that the pairing with E1, uh, with negative E1 minus E2, um, let's see, should be greater than, uh, yeah, so that should be greater than negative one. So, let's see, so if I pair with, um, yeah, so if I pair with E1, you get negative one here, E2 to get negative one here, and then on this side, like zero is fine because you know, all of these have non-negative coefficients, so we know that zero is always gonna be in there. So then we get this line here. So this is, so this is for, so this one is for V of uh, M E2 greater than negative, greater than negative one. This is for the V of uh, M minus E1 minus E2 greater than equal to negative one. And then finally, we just have that when you pair with E1, you should be greater than or equal to zero. And that gets you the Y axis, and then you're on the, on the right side of it. And so these are non-strict inequalities. It's greater than or equal to, or not greater than. This one we're gonna say V of M uh, E1 greater than or equal to zero. And then I get this polycode here. Okay. And so because this was an ample divisor, we can just reconstruct the variety from the polytope. So, um, I mean, moreover, the idea is that the condition for this to be an ample divisor is that the, that this fan is dual to this polytope. Right, you can see that right here as you can say, well, um, you know, or I guess I'm supposed to flip the polytope over. This is again, you know, this negative condition coming up. But the idea is if you take the dual fan to this polytope, it's the negative of this fan. And that's, you know, it's exactly because we've constructed it this way. But the thing that might have gone wrong is like, if this line were too far, then you get a triangle instead of this thing right here. And that corresponds to picking that divisor blows down the exceptional curve. Okay, so, you know, so this is, you know, standard torque geometry that a, uh, a divisor gives you, you know, some polyhedron in the lattice M, and it's, a, it's an ample divisor if that polyhedron, you know, has the same dual fan as your original fan, you know, maybe up to a minus sign, depending on your conventions. And yeah, and so, you know, if it's a complete fan, then you get a polytope. And, you know, the idea is that ample divisors correspond to polytopes. Okay. But, you know, there's always, there was something a little funny about this idea of ample divisors corresponding to polytopes, because it's like, you know, you can move the polytope around in your lattice M, and it doesn't change the ample divisor. But what does change is these coefficients here. And in fact, so what is the thing that you're changing when you move this polytope around? What you're changing is the linearization, the way that the big torus acts on your line bundle. So changing the linearization exactly corresponds to, to translating the polytope around. I guess I should say polyhedron because I might be in the quasi-projective case. So, so what we have is we have some line bundle L on X, and this corresponds to um, you know a choice of so this corresponds to a polyhedron P and M because you you just by taking the global sections and the, uh, the change of linearization well this corresponds to translation by an element of M and it makes sense because you know the idea is that 
you know, if this is some ample sections of some ample line bundle, then if you scale them all by the same factor, it doesn't change anything because you're, these are supposed to give you homogeneous coordinates of your torque variety in projective space. So if you scale them all up by some number, you know, and that number might depend on where you are in the torus, but it's just not going to do anything. So if I scale all of, if I, when I mult, act by t, all of these get scaled by the same t to the n, it's not going to do anything. And so what really matters is just the ratio of how these are scaled. That's going to determine the group action on your variety. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, with, so with, hopefully this, this makes it a little more clear why the change in linearization corresponds to shifting the polytope around. Of course, the way I like to think about that myself is that the linearization, you're leaving the polytope where it is, but you're just kind of, kind of moving the ambient uh, character lattice around. Okay, so <clears throat> what happens if you have a smaller torus inside and you're trying to take a potion? Well, actually, let me just pause for a second. Like, any questions so far? This is all pretty clear, hopefully. So is the reason we can't stretch the polytope because that would change the line bundle? That yeah, that's exactly right. If you change the line bundle, you stretch it. Because if, <clears throat> if you stretch it, I mean, in particular, you're changing the global sections, yeah. right? Um, and you know, you can, you know, so if I stretch this in this direction, I have more global sections, and so it's different line bundles. Yeah. And then, you know, I guess I should add that. So, uh, you know, scaling it up corresponds to uh, taking the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, you know, just the, the tensor power of the line bundles itself. So, you know, in particular, if you want to <coughs> recover this as a projective variety using the project construction, what you do is you take the code over this, and that gives you an affine torque variety if you look at the, um, <coughs> just the, the algebra of that, um, yeah, the monoid algebra of that, and then the, uh, um, and then if you take prod to that, you get the original torque rate back, along with an embedding in the projective space given by this ample line bundle. So the O of one for the prod will be this bundle here. Okay, so then you can imagine <coughs> that if you're taking some smaller torus inside your big torus. Well, that corresponds to, you know, in terms of the characters, um, you're taking, uh, when you take the quotient, you know, the characters you keep are gonna be the ones that lie on some hyperplane, because those are the ones that are gonna be invariant under um, the action of, you know, some the smaller torus. So exam for example, if you, you know, <clears throat> you can, like, so in this torus, you're scaling both X and Y, if you say, oh, well, I want the things that are invariant under scaling x, then it's saying, oh, we'll just set the x part of the character to zero, and then we just get this line here. And if we want to say, well, x and y scale at the same rate, then it's along this line here. <clears throat> and then the idea is that it's like, okay, so the subtorus you pick gives you the direction of the slice you take, and then the linearization lets you move the polytope relative to the slice. But you can also think of just moving the slice relative to the polytope which I find easier to visualize. Let me just draw the picture here. Is that, so if we want to do GIT, so you have T inside T big, uh, so invariants give a linear give a, a linear condition on M, and then the changing linearization moves polytope. <clears throat> so let me give you kind of a schematic picture here. This is it. So this is again our, our lattice M tensor R, which is the origin. And then you say we pick the invariance corresponding to some subtorus. <coughs> And then you say, okay, well, I have my polytope, which, you know, maybe it looks like this. And then as I change linearization, it moves the polytope around. And then something funny happens when I pass over a corner. Well, that's exactly what's happening 
in the variation of DIT when we have something like the ATIA plot. So then we can, you know, so move polytope to change linearization. So this is how you actually do these toric GIT quotients. Is you say, okay, I have my projective torque ready, that's a polytope. And then I have my subtorus that corresponds to slicing the polytope in a certain direction. And then <clears throat> I have my linearization, which gives me a choice of where to put the polytope relative to the slice. And you'll note that if I make the linearization too extreme in any one direction, it misses the polytope entirely, and then I just get the empty set. Okay. <clears throat> So I think, sorry. Is this like a, some sort of wall crossing? You know, oh yeah, absolutely. This is a wall crossing phenomenon for sure. Yeah, so the idea is that you can, you can make your linearizations into like a, a cone, and then when it changes, when the, the quotient changes, when you pass over some corner, that gives you a wall in the cone, cross it, and you get different behavior. So then one way you can interpret this is that this is the effective cone of the quotient variety, or some part of it, and then uh, the, the chamber corresponding to the linearization you picked is the ample cone, and then as you move around, you get other cones corresponding to other models. Yeah, so there's a whole big story with this uh, in terms of, you know, ball crossing. I mean. I mean, when people say wall crossing, there's kind of a large set of phenomena that they're talking about there, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, but this is definitely one example of it, where it's like, you know, you have some, some problem, and then your solutions get divided up into some, like, uh, you know, some convex space, like, of cones, and then there's some, like, then it gets more complicated based on you know, what the construction gives you, it's sort of locally constant, and then it hits, where it's constant for a while, then it hits a wall, and then it changes. <coughs> That's what exactly what happens here. So in, in this modular <coughs> space, are all of the wall crossing formulas given by flops, or? Um, <coughs> I don't really know how to parse that. Like, what do you mean by wall crossing formula? Well, this, just like context. the operation that you do when you pass through a wall. Is it oh, I see. A flop? Um, well, not necessarily, because flop means, so for one thing, it might be a divisorial contraction, so, which is not a flop. So it might mean that you, like, when you cross from one chamber to another, you take, on your variety, you take, uh, like, a divisor and contract it. Um, on the other, and so in the other cases, you'll have small birational modifications, which look like the ATIA flop, but they might not technically be flops, because they might be, uh, you know, for, you know, positive or negative, depending relative to the canonical divisor. So flop is a technical term being kx trivial, but it's going to look, like combinatorially it looks like some version of the ATIA flop, maybe much more complicated because you're in higher dimensions. Okay. Um, yeah. Other questions? Okay, let's, let's talk about an example. So let's see, what's the... So I think the simplest non-trivial example I can give you is if I have um, a one-dimensional torus acting on A3. So let's do an example where we have, I have T, and then this will be just you know, a C star, and then it embeds into three-dimensional torus that acts on A3. You know, this is a spec of AXYZ. Okay, we'll just use the complex numbers today. And, well, of course, you know, so when I do these kind of problems, I'm usually like, okay, let me put my, my torus first, and then, um, and then, we'll, and then the thing that will be varying is the linearization. So I believe what I want to pick today is I want to say that T acts on X, Y, and Z. 
and it sends them to Cx, Ty, and C inverse Z. Because I want I think this is what I want. I guess we'll find out. Um, we'll, we'll just see what this does. Um, and then So what does this correspond to? So what are the invariant characters for this in M? So the invariant characters. Let's see. So I get things like XZ and YZ, as, and then those are going to generate the lattice, right? Because um, maybe maybe there's one other, but product there. Yeah, I, oh, I guess I can also have x over y, but that's already in there, so maybe that's good enough. So I have xz, yz, etc. Okay, and so now, I mean, the issue becomes draw the picture. So, so my cone um, for this affine first ready, which in this case, so you know, with, with so so this cone, I mean, I can just think of it as sections of the trivial line bundle. So the cone is also the polyhedrons in this case because there's no non-trivial line bundles on this. So I can just say, well, my trivial line bundle is my ample line bundle. So what I get is I get the uh, you know, the usual cone. This is just let's see. Oh, that's the best way to draw this. Okay, there we go. So in the back, so you can imagine this is just like a cardboard box. Okay, so you have a cardboard box, and then let's see. So then the the way I'm going to slice it should be um, dual to the vector. Slice dual to the vector one, one, and negative one. So let's see. So that's to say, um, you know, so, so this is just to say like the, the x value plus the y value minus the z value is constant. Okay, so this is like, you know, if, if I have, let's see, if I have z equals x plus y. So what does that look like? Well, the, yeah. So then it looks like a slice like this. Um, yeah, and so then actually no, that is not the slice it. I think I want it to go the other way. Shouldn't you have the normals be one one negative one, or you know, translates in one one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the normal, right? Yeah. Dual to one one negative one. So then, yeah, and so then the the slice I take is like. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, so so let so this is the x y plane. The, the x y plane I have, x plus y is constant. And then as z increases, I still have x plus y is constant, but it's allowed to get bigger and bigger. So it's going to go off like this and like that. So you can see this is the polyhedron I get for the quotient when the slice is down here. All right, so. Let's uh, cross hatch that one. Okay, so yeah, not bad, right? 
So the idea is you can see that there's like, in the, in the shape of this is a polyhedron, you have like one edge here, another edge here which is bounded, and another edge here which is unbounded. And then as you adjust the linearization, that corresponds to moving along the normal direction. And so what happens is that if you move the linearization this way, you get the same picture. But if you move the linearization up, eventually you bump over this corner. And so this is, you know, this is chi, let's say this is chi, chi alpha, and this one is chi beta. But as I pass over here, then this edge has collapsed to nothing. So these are my two. Uh, so these are the two models I can get via this VGIT quotient, and you can see that as I vary the GIT picture, I slip over this, and then this line here, which is going to be a curve in the torque ready, gets shrink to nothing. Okay, so okay, so that's like the schematic picture, but like actually, let's draw the picture for real uh, and compute what these two polyhedron here are. So let's, let's call this one uh, P alpha and this one P beta. Okay, so let's say, um, so let, let's say that, X, that alpha corresponds to, um, you know, corresponds to, I guess I shouldn't use X, Y, Z, but let's just say that uh, MX plus MY plus MZ or this minus mz is equal to one. And then for beta, we're doing it with minus one. Okay. And then, okay, so then writing it out this way is nice because, well, what is the condition on the big cone? This, this big ambient cone is just saying that all the m's are positive, or not negative. Okay, so let's, Take a look at that. So for P alpha, what do we get? Well, you know, I get the invariant characters are going to be, you know, they're they're going to um, they're all going to differ by by some by elements that like x z y z, but it's all going to be like multiplied by something. In particular, in this one I have z, and we'll have z here, and then I want the uh, uh, the x and y is to those to all be non-negative. So I have z starts it off, and then I have x uh, x z in one direction, and y z in the other direction. And I'm never allowed to dip below the x part being zero or the y part being zero. It's the z squared. And so I can never go outside you know, this, this region. So it's just, oh, the x part is positive, the y part is positive, and the z is kind of along to the right. Like whatever the x and the y values are, they determine what the z value is. And so then, well, I just get something like this. Which, you know, if you kind of squint at this, but you don't have to squint very hard, you can just see, oh, it's just being a copy of A2. Okay, now on the other hand, when I'm down here, I have X and then I have Y. And then as I add, uh, as I increase how the, the, the presence of Z, I get more X's and Y's. So for P beta, I have this picture where I have y here, I have x here, and then I can do y squared z, I can do x squared z, but you know here, this, this line here is the condition that the x that the y part be non-negative, this is the condition the x part be non-negative, and this is the condition the z be non-negative. So this is like my 
So this one is mx greater than or equal to zero over here. This is mz greater than or equal to zero. And this is my greater than or equal to zero. So you can see that I have these three conditions. So you know the fan of this is going to be dual to this picture. It's going to have three rays corresponding to these three conditions. And you know, of course, I can just fill it in. This polyhedron goes on forever. But the dual picture to this is this thing right here. I have three rays like that. And so this corresponds to the blow up of a single point in A2. Okay, and this is really wonderful, right? Because this means that this blow up construction that you know maybe was a little, little bit weird and or maybe it's not more, you know, maybe it's something quite familiar to us, or maybe it's something that we've struggled with. Either way, we have another picture on it. So this means that if we understand the blow-up well, we can think of it as a nice example of our VGIT, or we can use this, VG, this VGIT, um, V stands for variation, this variation of GIT picture to understand the blow-up better. So in this picture, it unifies constructions like the blow-ups blow and blow-downs, along with these small modifications like the Atiyah flop. And so then you can see that these are united. You can think of this as a movie where the length of this guy right here shrinks down to a point. Okay, so, uh, so one small comment I'll add about uh, you know, with this wall crossing business is that often what's happening is there's some like continuous thing that's changing in the background and then it hits a snag and that's why this changes. And so the idea is that, you know, you can assign a metric that, uh, you know, coming from all this, you can assign a metric to your torque variety. And the idea is that as the parameter changes, the metric is making this line smaller and smaller. And then when you hit the wall, it's saying, oh, this thing has length zero. And over here it has negative length. So you've shrunk it and gotten rid of it. You've done some sort of algebraic surgery on your object to get to here. And it's the same story with the flop. The idea is with the flop, you have some metric coming from, you know, imposing a metric on your ample line bundle that's getting smaller and smaller as you get closer and closer to, you know, the Neff divisor that's not ample, shrinks the line bundle. And then on the other side, this negative length says, oh, I got to replace it with the line in the other direction. Uh, yeah. Did you make alpha and beta split? Uh, I did. Okay, so this one is alpha, and this one is beta. That is correct. Thank you. So to what extent can I see these things as like deformations? Because um, it seems like they're deformations over, say, like a real parameter of some sort. I mean, it's not like a deformation in the sense of like deformation theory, I don't think. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some sort of Like I want to say that maybe if you you can like think of this as like a deformation over like a tropical semi ring or something, but I'm not like confident in that. I mean, definitely this is not a deformation in sort of the algebraic category. But you know, maybe by kind of enlarging what your notion of ring is or something, you know, then then you can do some, then you can do this in that kind of setting. I mean, definitely this idea of like changing the metric, that's sort of a deformation, right? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of a deformation in differential geometry land. Um, and then, yeah, so this is, you know, the idea is like you have this kind of, when you're writing the minimal model program, like there's a lot of kind of approaches to geometry, right? And so one of them is via this notion of Ricci flow, where you have like a metric and, you know, it's sort of imbalanced. And so you want to kind of balance it out by, to make the, you know, the Ricci curvature or some kind of curvature, like have some sort of be constant in some sense, uh, whatever that means. Um, and then what's happening when you do the middle model program is that um, your metric, you, you try to run this and your metric becomes singular, which I think, I mean, it seems similar to this problem with like 
you know, applying this in other contexts. In the middle model program, the idea is, okay, well, we just change the ambient space and then pick up where we left off. Um, and yeah, I mean, so it's not such a simple picture because, you know, this whole notion of like a nice metric, uh, it's sort of, it's a lot easier to write that down when your variety is smooth, but doing these operations, it might make it not smooth anymore. Now in the target picture, there's no problem because all these things, if they're not smooth, they're orbifolds. Yeah. You know, these have like quotient singularities of kind of very nice type. So, you know, everything you can, or I guess it's not an orbifold if it's like on simplicial, but even then it's like, you know, you can, like you can kind of, you can sort of jump to the other side of the wall. This is the point of like the flip and kind of deal with those separately. They're at least toroidal singularities, so they're not really that bad. But yeah, as a deformation, I, yeah, I, I don't think there's like, like definitely in the world of schemes, it's not a deformation, but you know, there's a, probably a larger world in which you can make that precise. So the Kähler Ricci flow is like a deformation of the Kähler class. So is this sort yeah. of like a deformation of the Kähler class? This is, I mean, yeah, because yeah. the Kähler class is, it comes from the line level, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. just like, it's like an R line. Wow, that makes sense. So let's see, how much time do I have left? Okay, eight minutes. Okay, so I think, yeah, so one thing I would point out here is that, you know, like one of these pictures is more complicated than the other, right? This one is more complicated than that one. It has more features. So what happened to eliminate those features, you know, going from here to here? Or to produce a new feature going from here to here? It's kind of the same business. Um, so let's see, so the, yeah, so the action here is like I have T acting on X, Y, Z, sending X, Y, and Z to T, X, T, Y, and T inverse Z. And so let's, let's kind of go back to our more algebraic picture where we say, okay, I'm going to throw in another, um, you know, so I'm just going to, take a trivial line bundle and you have uh, S, you know, so you know, like we'll let S be our section and then we have T sends X, Y, Z, S to um, X, Y, Z, S to the M. Tx, Ty, T inverse Z, and then T, the M, S. Okay, and then the idea is that we're going to collect invariants and make products, kind of thing. Um, but the other way to think about this is just to say, okay, you know, I had my, you know, so let's schematically draw this guy as like a two dimensional thing because otherwise it gets too hard to draw. And we had, you know, a bunch of orbits and you know, here the orbits are not as poorly behaved as they were before. Um, you know, so the orbits kind of look more like this. So, you know, you have a lot of nice orbits in this case, because uh, the fact that you have this T inverse here means that if you make T small, then in the Z direction, you're going off to infinity. So everything is, you know, hunky-dory. But there is this issue that happens, like for example, when uh, when z is equal to zero, then you run into trouble because all those guys are getting sent down to the origin. And then, you know, when z is not equal to zero, you know, maybe you're okay. But if both x, so this is z equals zero, and then this would be like both x equals y equals zero. And then these guys, where z equal, where x and y are both zero, if I set t to infinity, I get sent down to the origin. So when you're under the origin, that's bad. On the other hand, when you're like, you know, out here, and you're not getting sent to the origin, 
these orbits out here, they're quite nice, they're even closed. So there, those are gonna be stable for any linearization we choose. And so the idea of the linearization is we add this extra degree of freedom to kind of pop us away from the variety itself. And then depending on the linearization, we might manage to avoid good enough box. And, and so the idea is if we, if we pop off of this, it doesn't matter what S is doing, we're still staying above this orbit, we're just, um, you know, we're never hitting the origin. And then the thing is, depending on the choice of linearization, well, if both X and Y are zero and M is positive, then um, even when T gets sent to zero, S is going to be going to infinity, so then this orbit will be okay. On the other hand, this orbit will be bad. Like anything where z is zero gets knocked out. On the other hand, when m is, when m is negative, then it's okay for z to be zero, uh, but we can't let x and y both simultaneously be zero. So we keep the z equals zero part. And the z equals zero part is bigger than this part. So the x equals y equals zero part, that will get shrunk all the way to a point, even if it's a nice orbit is what's happening here. And then here, this is the z equals zero, that gives you the exceptional divisor. So what happens is that this z equals zero, when uh, m is less than zero, the z equals zero part uh, maps to a p1. And that p1 is exactly this exceptional divisor here. Okay, so again, I really recommend Miles Reed's paper for this. He has pictures that are nicer than mine um, and kind of explains this in a lot of detail. And for the Atiyah flop, you have exactly the same thing happening. This is just kind of, this is the Atiyah flop with one variable lopped off, right? So if you want to do the Atiyah flop, it's exactly the same picture. have t just sends uh, x, y, z, w to t, x, t, y, t inverse z, t inverse w. And then, you know, you have the same schematic picture where your orbits look kind of like hyperbolas. And then you have two orbits that are not allowed to coexist. You have this vertical where I say x equals y equals zero, and the horizontal where z equals w equals zero, you can't have both of these orbits because in one you're kind of coming in this way, in another, you know, the like if one of them is going out to infinity, the other one is becoming to zero. So depending on the linearization you choose, you either remove this part and get a nice quotient, or you remove this part. You know, there's an, there's an inherent symmetry showing you got isomorphic varieties, but that isomorphism is not given by the, the natural, by rational map. So this is the picture of the Atiyah flop. And in terms of VGIT, you can see this as you have a four-dimensional cone that you're slicing, and whenever you go the, over the point of the cone, that's how that flip happens in the picture. Okay, I think we should stop here because we're out of time. Uh, any questions? Yeah, it's a really nice picture. Just like that this sort of technology for taking quotients works in this setting and lets you do, I mean, you can kind of do pretty much all of birational geometry this way once you have the fact that certain rings are finitely generated. But the whole difficulty in birational geometry is proving that things are finally generated. So this will be what we'll talk about in the next couple of lectures.